He came out of the desert, preaching redemption and repentance. He called for a radical change in the way the people of Israel worshipped their God. And he created a religious ritual which continues to this day. Who was this mysterious figure, garbed in animal skins like a prophet of old? To modern Christians, John the Baptist was the herald of the Messiah and may have been one of the first to recognize Jesus as the Son of God. To the Romans of his time, he was a dangerous rebel with threatening political motives. And to a 2,000-year-old sect, he was venerated above all other prophets. Did John the Baptist appear to pave the way for Jesus, or was he a rival Messiah? Why does the Bible devote so much time to his miraculous annunciation and birth? And what was the reason for the sensual dance of Salome that led to his brutal beheading? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. It is the year seven before the common era. The place, the hill country of Ein Karim near Jerusalem. From an inauspicious little village would come a man who would change history, John the Baptist. For reasons not fully understood by many scholars, the Gospel of Luke spends almost as much time describing John's miraculous annunciation and birth as it does describing the birth of Jesus. Why? According to the Gospel of Luke, John was the son of elderly parents, Zechariah, a priest, and Elizabeth, daughter of a priestly family. Elizabeth was a relative of Mary, the woman who would give birth to Jesus. While both John's parents were worthy in the sight of God, they were childless. The great births of the Old Testament, the births under divine control, were given to aged parents or to infertile couples who were also aged parents. That was the supreme miracle, as it were. There appeared to Zechariah an angel of the Lord. The angel said to him, Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord, their God. Luke 1, 16. Through either an inexplicable accident of history, or perhaps through divine will, John the Baptist lived at exactly the same time as Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospel of Luke specifically states that they were related, but what was the nature of their relationship? The story in Luke chapters 1 and 2 
puts John and Jesus in very close relationship. They are cousins, as it were. I would not be certain that that is an historical event because Luke seems primarily interested in insisting that Jesus is not only a, of royal descent, but also of priestly descent. And that puts Mary in contact with Elizabeth, in contact with the priestly uh, lineage. Now it happened that as soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She gave a loud cry and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Luke 1, 41. A favorite subject of many biblical artists and illustrators was the meeting between Mary, pregnant with Jesus, and her elderly cousin, Elizabeth, pregnant with John the Baptist. The Gospel of Luke makes it clear that John is to be a special child. After his birth, his father, Zechariah, proclaims the unique nature and stature of his young son. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Luke 1, 76. John and Jesus were born within six months of each other and in places not too far apart. As children, they may well have known one another, and perhaps even played together. After his miraculous birth to aged and infertile parents, John the Baptist mysteriously disappears from the biblical texts until he is an adult. Like his cousin Jesus, there is a curious gap in the biographical account of his early years. But what was John's role in the Bible? Could he merely have been a prophet who was eventually overshadowed by the works and message of the man called Jesus? Was his appearance intended to prepare the way for Christ? Or was he considered a rival Messiah? Mysteries of the Bible will return in a moment. The only biblical hint of John the Baptist's activities and whereabouts in his early years is intriguing in its vagueness. And the child grew up and waxed strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until the day he appeared openly in Israel. Luke 1, 80. Little is known of his childhood and formative years, but by the time he was an adult, John was a recluse living in the desert. John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was simple, consisting of locusts and wild honey. Matthew 3, 4. Thousands would flock to listen to this humble man who appeared out of the desert, preaching and prophesying. People would tremble at his apocalyptic visions that spoke of the coming end of the world and of the appearance of a Messiah. Countless more would take hope of freedom and redemption from foreign rule, for these are delicate and dangerous times. It is an era when the people of Israel are under Roman domination, their land under imperial oppression, and now merely a province of Rome known as Judea. Any message which spoke of deliverance from their oppressors was welcomed by the multitudes, and many would find hope of forgiveness from their sins in the words of John. 
who promised redemption if they heeded his prophecies. I like to picture him as this powerful, dynamic, charismatic figure who can shake the establishment, who can shake an individual that's listening to him as he preaches to their very core. Challenge the very foundation of their being with the power of his words and with his gesticulating and the wild look in his eye. This guy was something else. You wouldn't want to run into this guy at night. How did he come to be the person he was, this wild man of the desert who gained an enormous following of loyal supporters? Perhaps the answer lies with a reclusive Jewish sect living in the desert at the same time as John. They were known as the Essenes. It is believed that the Essenes occasionally adopted and reared children from surrounding communities. Did John perhaps become one of them? It's possible that he spent time at the Essene community at Qumran. There are some elements of uh, uh, the theology of Qumran that are similar to the preaching of John the Baptist, uh, this expectation of a coming judgment, certainly uh, um, living in preparation for it. So there, there are some parallels between the two. Until the mid-20th century, little was known about the obscure Essene sect. Then with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in these caves at Qumran, Essene lifestyle and religious beliefs were revealed beliefs with a curious similarity to those espoused by John the Baptist. The scrolls speak of an ascetic philosophy in which separation from mainstream Jewish culture was strictly adhered to. Exacting attention to ritual purity was also required. If John had grown up in an Essene community, he would have experienced a Spartan, cloistered, and pious childhood filled with daily prayers, silent communal meals, and most importantly, a strict regimen of ritual baths and purification in water. The most interesting place we find ritual immersion practiced in a um, extensive manner is the Dead Sea Scroll community. They have ritual immersion pools there. The Essenes and others were what we call Homero Baptists, daily Baptists. From earliest biblical times to today, religious Jews have ritually immersed themselves in water to purify themselves. Even now, modern Orthodox synagogues often have a special bathing pool for this purpose, known as a mikvah. Yet the Essenes took the immersion process one step further, demanding ritual bathing after every act of impurification. John's type of baptizing was a departure from the purification motive. His purpose of baptism was aimed at the removal of sins. He carried out the ritual not in a bath or special pool, but in the River Jordan. He may have chosen the site for symbolic reasons, equating it with the crossing of the children of Israel into the Holy Land after their exodus from Egypt. The river came to signify a gateway to salvation, freedom, and redemption. What John is saying is that when I take you across, as it were, and I presume that really means that you have to be immersed in the Jordan and cross over into the Promised Land, what you do is leave behind your sins and become a new person. All went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole of Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Matthew 3, 5. But was John's ritual derived from the Essene tradition? Is the baptism we know today an outgrowth of an ancient practice from a small desert sect? We may never know. And until more can be revealed about the Essenes and about John's so-called lost years, 
these questions will remain speculative. Wherever he spent his youth, John's mysterious appearance was a dramatic one. His preachings were in the apocalyptic tradition of the great Hebrew prophets. John the Baptist becomes one of the great prophets in the line of those prophets in the Old Testament that challenged Jewish traditions, that brought a message of salvation to the poor, and actually that began to talk about the good news of what God was doing in this world. So in a sense, what Luke wants to do is let us know uh, the basic themes about the coming kingdom of God that Jesus is going to talk about ahead of time. So that in a sense, Jesus is not the first one to preach the gospel that we know about the kingdom of God. John is. John the Baptist promised wrath and destruction to the erring people of God who had deviated from the ancient laws of Moses. Even the temple priests were not exempt from his condemnation. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. Matthew 3, 9. He says, who told you to come out, you bunch of snakes? You're coming out to be, repent so that you can escape the judgment. You're not coming out to repent because you're really sorry of your sins. No, real repentance comes from the heart. And you have to turn around and be transformed from your heart. John's message and his unique rite of baptism brought thousands out from Jerusalem. A group of followers began to form around him a group that steadily grew as more came to the River Jordan to be baptized and stayed to be near his charismatic presence. One of those who came to hear John's message and to be baptized was a young man from Nazareth, a man he may not have seen since his childhood, his cousin Jesus. Mysteries of the Bible will be right back. John the Baptist had garnered a huge following that came to him to be baptized and to hear his sermons. One of them was his cousin from Nazareth, Jesus, whom he may not have seen since childhood. Then Jesus appeared. He came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Matthew 3, 13. I've always thought that uh, the reason Jesus left his, his uh, home in Nazareth and, and presumably his trade, he was a carpenter, was because he heard that there was a new prophet in Israel um, preaching to the people and proclaiming that God was about to do something new. Jesus went down and was baptized uh, with all the others who came out to hear um, John the Baptist. And according to the biblical tradition, when, when he did that, something happened to him. He had this religious experience. When Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, my beloved. Matthew. 3.16 The story of Jesus begins with his baptism at the Jordan. According to the biblical tradition, when, when he did that, something happened to him. Jesus the carpenter from Galilee became Jesus the preacher. Thus, according to Christian scripture, following his baptism by John, the ministry of Jesus Christ begins. A heavenly voice that Jesus hears proclaims him as the Son of God. 
But did John or his followers recognize Jesus as the Messiah? This passage in the Gospel of Matthew provides a clue. John said unto Jesus, Why comest thou to me for baptizing? It is I who should come to thee. Matthew 3, 14. Though the Gospels clearly state that John proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah, recent biblical scholarship questions that. The later Christian tradition will see him specifically proclaiming the coming of Jesus, but that's to read the tradition backwards after knowing the end of the story and looking back and, and projecting that onto John's preaching. John the Baptist was preparing a people for the apocalyptic God. Those texts then were taken later by Christians and adapted and adopted so that John the Baptist is foretelling the coming of Jesus. But that was not what John the Baptist was doing. He was preparing for the arrival of God. While John was clearly preparing the way for a time when the people would be redeemed from sin and affliction, the Gospels indicate that many of his contemporaries felt that John himself might be the expected Messiah. A feeling of expectation began to grow amongst the people and all began to wonder whether John might be the Christ. Luke 3, 15. The very word Messiah means the anointed one of God, though it is debatable how John's contemporaries might have interpreted the word. There is no clear first century idea of what Messiah means common to everyone. What there is, is a constant heightening hope that God will do something to save his people. Will God need a human instrument at all? If he does, will that be a priest, for example? Will that be a military leader? If there is such a human helper, as it were, then let us call him Messiah, the one sent by God. What made the promise of a coming Messiah so relevant at the time? Many scholars feel the answer has as much to do with politics as it does with religion. It was the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. Israel had long been subjugated by Rome. Jewish religious practices were threatened and the temple priests were forced to cooperate with the pagan Roman authorities. Religious ritual had become corrupt. The people began to look for salvation. Many of them pinned their hopes on the coming of a redeemer. There were great messianic hopes in Israel that any great leader was perceived by the populace in Palestine as a messianic leader. In the time of the Maccabees, the hammer was considered to be uh, a messianic figure. The time of Bar Kokhba, he was considered a messianic figure. John the Baptist definitely was considered a messianic figure. The messianic promise may have been one of the reasons that attracted Jesus of Nazareth to John the Baptist. For though this aspect is downplayed by Christian tradition, the Gospels make it clear that Jesus became a follower of John. It could very well be that Jesus first understands John as the prophet like Moses. That is the main figure, the center figure. He definitely associates with John and to some degree puts himself under John by being baptized by him and then assisting him. Yet some time after his baptism, Jesus left the company of John the Baptist, taking two of John's own disciples with him. When Jesus had baptized more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. John 4, 1. According to the Gospel account, it is clear that even though John the Baptist seems to have acknowledged the unique role of Jesus in baptism, he had not yet accepted that he was the Messiah Later, John would send two of his disciples to Jesus to question his goals and his motives.
John called unto two of his disciples and sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or should we await another? Luke 7, 19. In time, John's disciples would also question Jesus about the miracles that he performs. Jesus' response to them would be that his miracles were all signs that indeed the Messiah had come. Nevertheless, Jesus would continue to praise and acknowledge the greatness of John. Behold, I send my messenger before thee, and he shall prepare the way for thee. I say unto you, among those born unto women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Luke 7, 28. Whether Jesus was a disciple of John, a rival of John, or the inheritor of John's prophetic message, clearly he had the highest regard for John, the last of the great Hebrew prophets. Mysteries of the Bible will be right back. Whether or not John the Baptist was the mentor of Jesus, the two men eventually went separate ways and preached separate messages. Because of its political overtones, John's penetrating message gradually became more and more of a threat to Herod and the Romans. The social unrest under Roman occupation, the Jewish people's search for prophets and their expectation of a Messiah was a direct result of the prevailing political situation. For at least a hundred years, the Romans had ruled the Holy Land with an iron hand, exploiting the local populace and their wealth of natural resources. After an attempt at Jewish rebellion had taken place, Rome exerted an even tighter grip on the province. In John the Baptist's time, Pontius Pilate was the emissary and representative of the Roman Empire in Jerusalem. In turn, Rome had set up a local puppet king by the name of Herod Antipas to oversee tax collection and the silencing of anti-Roman sentiment. Both Pilate and Herod were hated by the people. Bands of rebels still inhabited the surrounding hill country, and anti-Roman terrorism often occurred. Under these conditions, it was not unlikely that the ruling authorities saw John the Baptist as a threat. Many modern scholars believe that John's message and preaching were aimed primarily at the established authorities, that he was more than a religious ascetic, and perhaps even a revered and popular revolutionary figure. The big sin in the first century is collaboration with the exploitative control of the Jewish homeland by Roman imperialism. What John the Baptist is saying is accepting Rome as the will of God, or accepting it as good, or not even resisting it, is sinful. And you must repent of that sin. You must resist Rome in every way you can. Scholars continue to debate whether John the Baptist should be considered a political revolutionary. But a contemporary of John's had no question. His name was Joseph ben Matthias, better known to history as Flavius Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian who joined the Roman side and helped conquer his homeland for the empire. His histories are some of the most insightful evidence we have of events in the Holy Land during the first century of the Common Era. Josephus was unequivocal about John the Baptist's growing political power. 
Herod the king feared lest the great influence John had over the people might incline him to raise a rebellion, for the people seemed ready to do anything John should advise. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, 5, 2. I wouldn't want to dismiss John as someone who was uh, simply a political figure. John was speaking out of highly religious inspiration and out of highly religious motives. Israel had been a conquered land, uh, a taxed province of one empire after another ever since uh, the 6th century when they were conquered by the Babylonians. They, they'd never really been independent again. John's religious ardor had made Rome and its minions deeply suspicious of him. He criticized the Roman-backed king, Herod Antipas, turning him into a powerful enemy. The primary reason for John's condemnation was because of the king's sexual and social behavior. Herod had married his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. John said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Mark 6, 17. Herod was known to be an evil, cunning, clever, diabolical king who had an affair with his brother's wife and took her to be his and had an obsession with her daughter as well. Herod was challenged for his morality by John the Baptist demonstrating that John, uh, so to speak, not, not only talked the talk, but walked the walk. Some scholars believe that John's attacks on Herod were not simply an expression of moral outrage at his personal behavior, but reflected a broader concern about his family lineage. If you're going to condemn a ruling family's sexual practices, well, you're to some extent saying that you object to them politically too. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's much more precise. It says that you can't put a leader over you who is not your brother and uh, who is not one of your own. These Herodian leaders were not considered Jewish by the population. These were Arabo greco leaders, who, some of whom have been quasi-Judaized. So the people in Palestine objected vociferously to the imposition of this alien, foreign, ruling class. Within a political context, John's preaching may have been seen as a direct attack on the legitimacy of Rome and of King Herod himself. John said unto the multitudes, Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree failing to bring forth good fruit will be cut down and cast into the fire. Luke 3, 9. Whether or not he was preaching revolution, John paid the price for condemning the king and the rulership of Rome. Herod had him arrested and placed in a cell in his palace, 30 miles south of Jerusalem. The voice of John in the wilderness was thus effectively silenced. Mysteries of the Bible will be right back. These are the majestic ruins of Macarus, palace fortress of Herod Antipas, puppet ruler of Judea. Located 30 miles southeast of Jerusalem, it was to this place that John the Baptist was taken upon his arrest 2,000 years ago. Though one gospel claims that Herod Antipas imprisoned John because he feared his power and influence among the people, the Gospel of Mark provides a rather different version of the story. Herod himself had sent forth to have John arrested and bound up in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. Herodias was furious with John and wanted to kill him, but she could not. 
For Herod feared John, knowing him to be a good and just man. When Herod heard John speak, he was greatly perplexed and liked to listen to him. Mark 6, 17. John had publicly condemned Herod for marrying his brother's wife, an act specifically forbidden by scripture. The animosity that this criticism created between Herod's wife, Herodias, and John the Baptist is the stuff of legends. According to the biblical account, Herodias took revenge upon the Baptist through her beautiful young daughter. When Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company. She pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant whatever she might ask. And she, instructed by her mother, said, Give me on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Matthew 14, 8. The name of Herodias' daughter was Salome, but it is a name not mentioned in the Bible. We know it only from the history of Josephus. Neither Josephus nor the Bible mentions that Salome's dance was openly erotic, but tradition has forever associated her dance with John's grotesque fate. But was John the Baptist actually beheaded simply because of a cruel and brutal request by Herod's stepdaughter? Some scholars doubt it. To perform an execution during a banquet was considered the height of bad taste. To do it at the behest of a woman who wanted entertainment, that is a story that goes back almost 200 years to the time of Cato in the Roman Republic as how not to be a good ruler. It's a marvelous story. It does exactly what it's supposed to do, blacken Antipas, but I don't think it's what happened. Whatever the method of his execution, John the Baptist was put to death by Herod in the palace of Macarius. Remarkably, though his impact on biblical history was of major importance, his ministry had lasted less than two years. John's disciples came and took the body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Now, when Jesus heard of this, he withdrew from there and departed in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Matthew 14, 12. I think that um, John's violent death, if anything, would... Um, remind Jesus of the violent nature of the end of a prophet. He himself at one point says, Oh Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, I would have opened my arms to embrace you as a chicken opens up her wings to embrace her chicks. So that he's very aware of the consequences of a message like John's and therefore of his. In another curious parallel between John and Jesus, there are even hints in the Bible that some believe John the Baptist would, like Jesus, be resurrected from the dead. When King Herod heard about him, he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead and therefore mighty works had been done by him. Mark 6, 14. After John's execution, many of his disciples became disciples of Jesus. But that does not mean that the message of John the Baptist disappeared. In fact, the Acts of the Apostles tells of St. Paul discovering a group of John the Baptist's followers in Asia Minor, about 25 years after his death. A sect that had never even heard of Jesus. Yet even the preaching of St. Paul did not convert all of John the Baptist's disciples to Jesus.
This is a ritual baptism being practiced by the Mandaeans, who date their origins to before Christ. Although most scholars believe they first appeared sometime during the second century of the Common Era. The Mandaeans live in remote areas of Iraq and Iran, although families have recently migrated as far as Australia and America. Neither Muslim nor Christian, the Mandaeans venerate one prophet above all others, John the Baptist. Repeated baptism, as opposed to the Christian's once-in-a-lifetime ritual, reflects their commitment to the ancient desert prophet. The legacy of John the Baptist endures even now. For 2,000 years, baptism has been one of the most common sacraments in all of Christianity. Whether performed for an infant in a church, or celebrated in the actual River Jordan, like these modern-day converts, the sacred ritual created by John is still very much alive. John the Baptist's life and legacy continues to resonate in many parts of the world. This Russian Orthodox Church in Washington, D.C. was consecrated in his name. Each September, it celebrates the Feast of the Beheading of St. John. It is then that the church's most prized possession is offered to the congregation for veneration. It is a piece of bone, reputed to be from John's skull. It was a gift from a monastery in the Judean desert. But John is honored in Muslim circles as well. To this day, many believe his skull is housed in this monument, in the middle of the great mosque in Damascus, Syria. Separating fact from parable in the Bible continues to challenge theologians and biblical scholars alike. In the case of John the Baptist, there is rare consensus on the issues of his life. Given the important place he holds in the Gospels, some may ask whether Christianity could have taken root without him. It is hard for me to overestimate the importance of John. I think the disciples and followers of John were terribly important in the earliest followers of Jesus. They were there. John was the highest of all the prophets in the history of the Bible. That's where Jesus put him. That's where I'd like to leave him. Though his true purpose in the Bible may long remain a subject of debate, the evolution of Christianity was indelibly influenced by the man we know as John the Baptist. This is the Biography Channel. You want to be yourself, but you're not allowed to be yourself. This is the Biography Channel. I was just beside myself with anger and disappointment. This is the Biography Channel. I'm the only actress he knows you have to pay to keep your clothes on. Reality meets personality only on the Biography Channel. Biography Channel. What a concept!